lost program in there. Still got it. Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Your own colleagues are telling me, calling me, telling me. And when I came out here on this stage and told the public what happened, it was a recitation of what of course it was not the right decision it was a wrong decision According to the timeline given by Texas DPS, Uvalde police were inside the school two minutes after the gunman arrived. Standard protocol requires all All right, so we're... Okay. Okay. Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. That was me yesterday. while she was here. There was never a dull day with her. And Ana Rodriguez with one hope for her 11-year-old daughter, Maite. I don't want her just to be another face. I don't want any of those kids to be just another face. Each one of them has a story to tell. And this just horrendous act just cut everything short for them. And that is the hope, the plea from these families. Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Good night and thank you for joining us. We apologize for technical difficulties that we've had for almost 11 and a half minutes, but we're going to start the 6 o'clock news now. Governor Greg Abbott back in Uvalde today after another press conference. And for the second time in a row, he was interrupted. 
Last time it was his Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. This time it was San Antonio State Senator Roland Gutierrez. Now, Uvalde is in Gutierrez's district and he's been trying to help his constituents, of course, deal with this horrific shooting from Tuesday where two teachers and 19 students were killed. But you see, this interruption this time was a little bit different than the last time. Our John Paul Barajas is live in Uvalde to explain. John? Steve, Stephania, that's right. When Beto interrupted Governor Abbott, he stormed in. He pointed at the governor and said, this is on you. That was not the case this time. The state senator walked in. He apologized for interrupting the press conference and then emotionally urged the governor for change. Take a listen. Your own colleagues are telling me, calling me, telling me an 18-year-old should have, shouldn't have a gun. This is enough. Call us back, man. Outside, outside the press conference, the senator mentioned he wanted a special session to try and up the age limit to buy a gun. He threw out the ages 21 or 24. He also recommended red flag laws. Abbott was not clear on if a special session would be called. He made no direct comment about gun reform or specifically AR-15s. He did mention mental health concerns and that more needs to be done there. And the status quo is unacceptable, as well as the changing information to the timeline of the mass shooting. And when I came out here on this stage and told the public what happened, it was a recitation of what people in that room told me, whether it be law enforcement officials or non-law enforcement officials, whatever the case may be. And as everybody has learned, the, inf the information that I was given turned out in part to be inaccurate. And I'm absolutely livid about that. Now, this press conference was originally about re uh, state resources being brought in to help those impacted, uh, like funds for all funeral expenses, counselors, and other financial aid. Uh, the governor wanted to make sure that they're doing everything they can to assist people during, during these tough times. And if uh, you want to hear more about the state senator and what his remarks were, we'll have him on the night beat tonight. In Uvalde, John Paul Barajas, KSAT, 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Today, the Texas Department of Public Safety gave a detailed timeline of what happened on Tuesday. It's the timeline that the governor was referring to. It reveals just how long students were locked in a room with that gunman. We created a detailed look into that timeline, and it revealed from the time the first 911 call was made when the gunman crashed his vehicle to the time he was killed was an hour and 20 minutes. It also revealed the children in classrooms 111 and 112 at Robb Elementary were locked inside with that gunman for more than 40 minutes, and they made numerous 911 calls asking for help. DPS Director Steve McCraw said Uvalde Consolidated ISD Police Chief Pete Arredondo was the scene commander and had incorrectly assumed children were no longer at risk when the gunman was just barricaded inside. That decision caused officers not to enter the school or that school classroom. Of course it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision, period. For a full look at that press conference and the timeline we've been talking about, you can head to our website at ksat.com. Also right now, new at six, while investigators look at the timeline of all of these events, we're also learning more about how police are trained to deal with active shooters. Many officers learned that at the Alert Center in San Marcos. One of the experts there says that a lack of training, leadership and equipment led to a delayed response at Robb Elementary. KSAT's Camilla Juarez has the story. According to the timeline given by Texas DPS, Uvalde police were inside the school two minutes after the gunman arrived. Standard protocol requires all law enforcement agencies to arrive quickly and stop active killing, according to the assistant director for the alert center, John Kirkut. So now we're going to have to forcibly breach and enter and stop this person or these kids that have already been injured from dying as a result of those injuries. A challenge for responding officers is even the sound of the door opening could make officers a target. And without a shield or adequate body armor, officers are powerless against an AR-15, which is likely why Uvalde police were grazed by bullets, then waited 30 minutes for tactical gear. If you're going to walk into a barrage of gunfire and you're the first person's going to go down, second person's going to go down, third person's 
It's almost like landing in the beaches of Normandy. Unfortunately, tactical gear did not arrive from Border Patrol until 45 minutes after the suspect made entry. Although Uvalde has a SWAT team, it's unclear where the unit was or why Border Patrol was bringing gear. But the time that it took is indicative of we haven't done enough of the right type of training. We didn't have enough of the right type of tools and equipment. As over 40 minutes passed, law enforcement began evacuating students in other classrooms by breaking the windows and directing students to safety. McCurt says campus police are required to take an eight hour course in active shooter training, which is only half of what all other agencies are required to take. It's not just the type of training, it's how you train, how often you train, and being pushed to your limits in a training environment and coached through those difficult moments. And eight hours is good, more is always better. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. You're dealing with an AR-15, difficult for law enforcement, also for healthcare professionals. Tonight, I talked to members of the trauma team that treated those young survivors from Uvalde. They tell me they wish there were more lives to save. Dr. Lillian Liao was one of the surgeons who first saw the patients after they were airlifted to San Antonio. This is the second mass casualty event she has been on call for. The difference between what she saw from Sutherland Springs and what she saw Tuesday, the little bodies that came into the trauma unit. Bodies, she says, that were suffering from what is technically called severe destructive wounds. That means um, areas of the body, parts are not quite identifiable. Um, we're missing soft tissue, we're potentially missing some bone, um, muscle. I see gunshot wounds every single day and um, it, you can tell the difference immediately. It's like an explosion, it's like a firework went off in their body basically. Tonight on the Night Beat, I take a behind the scenes look at what this University Hospital trauma team faced on Tuesday. Dr. Liao and her team of nurses very honest about the job they had to do. Their wish, more people could have been saved, and what encouraging things they have seen from the South Texas community after the ugliness and the bloodshed of Tuesday. It's on the night beat at 10. Also a bit of good news today, one of those patients that they treated at university on Tuesday went home this afternoon. Mm. Certainly glad about that. All right, time now is 619 and we're taking a live look here at 410 at McCullough. As you can see, it is Friday and yeah, this is usually when people are going home and it's a holiday weekend, but no traffic there to report. New at six caught on camera, now caught in handcuffs. Bear County Sheriff's deputies arrested two 16 year olds last night, another this afternoon. Deputies think they were part of a crew of car burglars that were caught on tape in a northwest side neighborhood. Garrett Berger takes us through their high speed chase and the subsequent arrest. This crew of car burglars, four and all the Bear County Sheriff's Office believes and all teens was caught on video Thursday morning. Lots of people have seen this video because one thing stands out, the AK style rifle one of them is holding as he jiggles car door handles. It obviously gave us a sense of urgency. The sheriff's fear that an unsuspecting resident might come across them as they return home from a late shift or taking their dog out. And one of these little uh, you know, thugs is, is, is going to take out a, an innocent civilian. That's our fear. That's what keeps us up at night. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the organized crime unit worked with Northside ISD police to identify suspects and get leads. BCSO set up surveillance Thursday night near Valley High and Loop 410 and ended up in a high-speed chase with three to four teens in a stolen vehicle before they bailed out. Absolutely. Same group. Same group of guys. Ultimately, they arrested two 16-year-olds. They haven't been charged for the car burglaries, but one faces unauthorized use of a vehicle, evading arrest, both in a vehicle and on foot, and failure to identify himself while he had a warrant. The other, evading arrest in a vehicle and on foot. One of the teens, the sheriff said, had tattoos consistent with the Texas Mexican Mafia. Is he a member or is he just, does he idolize these guys to the point where he emulates their tattoos, uh, which is a dangerous game to play as well. The sheriff says their stolen vehicle also had stolen mail and IDs. The AK from the video was not there. And while an SAPD helicopter pilot saw one with a handgun, deputies couldn't find it either. The car that they were caught in at the time that car was stolen the report indicates that there was a gun in it when it was stolen. Steve Cantu, whose security camera captured the suspected burglars in the first place, stayed up all Thursday night into Friday, checking his cameras and watching windows. But with at least two suspects caught as of early Friday afternoon, 
he felt a little easier. I should be able to try to, to sleep better. But, you know, one, one can only hope, right? <laughs> Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A BCSO spokeswoman said deputies had also detained another teenager this afternoon that they believe was connected to the Thursday car burglaries. His charges weren't immediately made available. All right, and now we're going to take a live look outside. This is our south side. City cam, 97 degrees right now. Yeah, it's a hot one, but we're going to talk about the weekend, what plans you can have just in case you want to get out. Our Adam Kasky is going to be right back. All right, Adam Kasky has been tracking the weather as we start our holiday weekend. A lot of people very excited for the next three days. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be very summer like I mean, it, Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start to summer. It's going to play the part weather wise feeling like summer a bit windy at times. So if you have outdoor plans, you want to anchor down the tents, the tablecloths, whatever could blow away sunshine. It's going to be the rule for the foreseeable future here. Take a look at our forecast this weekend. Upper 90s, right near 100. It wouldn't shock me if we did hit triple digits, even officially in San Antonio the next couple of days. The wind picks up Sunday and Monday, gusts up to 30 miles per hour. So that's something you'll be noticing in particular. Today we topped out at 99. That's 10 degrees above average. And check it out, one degree shy of the record set back in 2011. Now Pleasanton and Catula, 100 degrees, Eagle Pass at 99, Kerrville 94, New Braunfels 96. It's a warm evening and there is a little break in the humidity right now, but it's gonna surge back into place and take over again later on tonight. Tomorrow morning, low 70s around San Antonio, some upper 60s as you get into the hill country. By tomorrow afternoon, it's more of the same, just like today. Very similar conditions. The wind will just be picking up a little bit later this weekend. We talked about that a moment ago. Now, upper 90s, Saturday, Sunday, Memorial Day, mid 90s, a few degrees lower on Memorial Day, a little extra morning cloud cover there, but 90s, that's the trend. As for our weather pattern, a few showers in far west Texas near Alpine, but overall, big blue H, H the upper level high that's going to be pressing down on us and in control of our weather here through this weekend. So tomorrow early risers will be greeted by some clouds. Otherwise, a sunny day 73 at 7 a.m. by noon 88 98. The high temperature south southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. There's that wind picking up again on Sunday gusts up to 30 miles per hour Sunday Memorial Day even on into Tuesday. If you're headed to the beach or bay, it's going to be windy. Bays will be choppy and we'll have some seas of about three to five feet along the uh, beach and of course choppy bays. All right, temperatures 90s. I wish I had better news in terms of rainfall chances, but unfortunately they're just not there. Thank you. Was there a turning point or two? I don't know. Um, I'm a little flustered. That's the UTSA baseball manager Pat Hallmark after his Roadrunners pulled off an upset in big board sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Six-year NFL veteran J. Ron Curse made a huge impact last season with the Dallas Cowboys, his first with the squad. The veteran safety led the boys with 101 total tackles, a go with two interceptions and 10 passes defended. He made his first start in week two and took over as a defensive play caller at midseason. In his first five years in Minnesota, and Detroit. He mainly played on special teams, but now he's a key member of the Cowboys secondary. It's very exciting for me, uh, you know, consider, considering the trajectory of my career, uh, you know, to be at this point that I'm at now, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge accomplishment for me, uh, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm still, you know, with the same mindset, uh, you know, it's, it's more out there for me and I'm, I'm working to go get that. Back in March, the boys and Curse agreed on a two-year deal worth $10 million after he made $1.1 million last season. Minnesota Vikings quarterback Kellen Mond is getting ready for his second NFL season. Drafted in the third round last season, Mond played in just one game, completing two or three passes for five yards. Now he's learning under new head coach Kevin O'Connell and new offensive coordinator Wes Phillips. I'm just out here having fun and I'm, I'm just looking to get better every day and you know every single day I, I do certain things that are, that are good and you know I'm able to come to the side talk to Kevin and you know there's always certain things that I could do slightly better and you know I, I go back and I evaluate the tape and then I try to get better every day so you know I'm not really worried about you know competition and all these different things you know I think if uh, you know if I handle myself if I play the best that I can then you know things will work itself out. 
Bond recently bought a man a new bicycle after he overheard of that man say his bike was stolen multiple times. I ended up having an appointment that I had to rush to, so I ended up coming back to the store uh, and I asked him if I could, you know, buy him a bike. And uh, we ended up having a great conversation. Then a couple of days later, I called him and uh, was able to bring him the bike. Uh, and then we were able to talk a little bit more. And, you know, he actually knows some of the people that I know uh, from Minneapolis. So it was, it was kind of a uh, weird connection. It's pretty cool. Mond is certainly making a difference in the Minneapolis community. UTSA baseball top number 14 Southern Miss at the Conference USA baseball tournament today. Top of the nine tied at six when Ryan Flores crushes a solo homer to the deepest part of the park center field for the final run of the game. That ball traveling 428 feet. Pitcher Simon Miller locked it down on the bottom of the ninth and UTSA beats the tourney's top seed Southern Miss seven to six. Flo providing the game winner. Clearly he likes hitting here. We played here two weeks ago and he he hit the ball well here and they got the best pitching staff in the league and one of the best pitching staffs in the country. So Flo just likes hitting here, I guess. So I hope he stays hot. UTSA will face the winner of Southern Miss, Florida Atlantic tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. in the conference semifinals. Last night in softball, O'Connor faced West Laco at Cabinus Field in the Class 6A Regional Final. Bottom of the second, Haley Carter crushes a big three-run homer to center field for the first runs of the game. Panthers go up 3 to nothing and they win Game 1, 5-1. to one. So Game 2 is tonight at 7 at Cabinus Field. And Corpus Game 3, if necessary, is tomorrow afternoon. A lot of exciting baseball and softball going yeah, on out there, Larry. Big home runs. Look at that. Go Roadrunners. Yes. They beat the top seed. They should just win it, right? Just call up the rest. There you go. That's I what like I that say. Idea. That's what I say. <laughs> We're back in two minutes. The Department of Public Safety revealing new details about the timeline of the initial police response to that deadly attack at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. And in the news conference, a shocking admission that the first officers who responded should have gone in sooner. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the story. This afternoon, Texas Department of Safety officials admitting that officers who first responded to Robb Elementary should have acted sooner to take down the gunman. Authorities say the incident commander believed he was no longer dealing with an active shooter, but a barricaded subject and that the children were no longer at risk. Hey, from the, from the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, the, of course it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision, period. There's no no excuse for that. Authorities now saying that it appears that the gunman got into the school from a door that was propped open by a teacher and was never confronted by a school resource officer before entering the building. That officer was not on scene, not on campus, but had heard the 911 call with a man with a gun, drove immediately to the area. And so he drove right by the suspect who was hunkered down behind a vehicle where he began shooting at the school. At 1144, 14 minutes after the first 911 call was made, 19 officers from various agencies made it outside the classroom door where the suspect was barricaded behind a locked door. But they did not go in. Instead, they waited for a tactical team, which arrived about 30 minutes later. During today's press conference, authorities talking about those 911 calls that came in from inside that classroom. You can hear over the 911 call, three shots were fired. 35 minutes after CPD SWAT arrived, officers breaking through the door and killing the suspect. Just two months before this tragedy, Uvalde School District had trained for an incident like this, holding an active shooter response drill. Families, neighbors, the Uvalde community struggling to understand. What was your reaction to everything that you heard? That press conference got I'm, really heated. I'm sick, I'm sick, I wanna throw up, I'm angry. I mean, this guy needs to resign. And questions still surrounding those 911 calls from children inside that classroom. Dispatchers knew that there were some still alive. Officers on the scene apparently not told, raising more questions and concerns about that communication breakdown. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Uvalde, Texas. Keep this in mind next time you do your grocery shopping. So we all know this, you know, food prices have increased over the past few months, but there's one thing that's holding steady. You're looking at it right there, and that's rotisserie chickens. Other chicken products like eggs, though, have become noticeably more expensive. But a lot of retailers like Sam's Club, Costco, and BJ's Wholesale Club aren't budging on that spit roasted poultry. There's a reason for it. Analysts say if customers come in for a rotisserie chicken, they will most likely also buy other items they also say most customers remember how much the rotisserie chicken cost before and a price hike would be more noticeable. 
A lot of companies see rotisserie chickens as a so-called loss leader, meaning they may lose money on it, but they hope to make it up on other sales. The economy of rotisserie chicken, right there. Actually like, very interesting. Yeah. 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 All right, so now we're taking a live look outside right now. 96 degrees, I believe this is the camera that we have near the airport. It looks so pretty out there. You know what I'm thinking about? Barbecuing. <laughs> Barbecuing. I was really? thinking about rotisserie chicken, actually. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when they talked about rotisserie chicken and how they, you know, car uh, gas stations used to yeah. do that with car washes. Oh, They sure. throw in a car wash for free. They don't do that so much anymore, but no. that used to be how they would get people to buy gas yeah. from there. Now it's not that Now way. it's not that way. No. We're not so fortunate. <laughs> we topped out at 99 degrees this afternoon. That was one degree shy of the record high for today. 100 the high in Pleasanton and Catula as we go through this evening. Summer like right now, 96 by 8 o'clock, 93, 10 o'clock, 85, and increasing humidity as well. We'll talk more about the Memorial Day weekend, how hot it's going to get, and your beach and bay forecast coming up. So we're heading into the unofficial start of summer. A lot of people are going to be thinking about grilling, going down to the beach, going to the lake, and this weekend looks perfect for that. Yeah, actually kind of felt like the official start of summer was like a few weeks ago yeah. before we got yes. this rain, Adam. Uh, it, yeah, it did. And we're going to actually, I'm going to show you the breakdown of temperatures this month and uh, how it compares to average in a moment. First of all, as we go forward, our temperatures well into the 90s again, Saturday 98, Sunday 98, and even into Memorial Day 95 degrees. So well above average, which is 89, but not quite record breaking. But it wouldn't surprise me if we did even hit 100 a couple of times this weekend and even into early next week. All right, we could use some rainfall. It was look, I'm not complaining about what we got earlier on Tuesday night, but we still need more. Take a look at this interesting graphic. This is the percent of normal precipitation. So if it said 100 percent, that would mean that we got the average amount over the past 30 days, but we are way under that usually or I should say mostly about 30 to 40 percent of our normal precipitation over the past 30 days. Pearsall is one of the exceptions there. We've had more rain farther south and southwest of San Antonio during that time period. Since May 1st, 0.86, that's all we've gotten. That's about three inches below average. And year to date rainfall, we're about four and a half inches, which is almost eight inches below average. So running below average in precipitation, month to date and year to date. Temperature wise, this May, it is on track to be the hottest May on record. I'll get out of the way so you can see this. Uh, you look at day by day and we've by and large been above average. We're about six and a half degrees above average. The coolest temperature reading was actually just yesterday morning at uh, 59 degrees, but uh, that has come to an end and now we're back well above average. All right, take a look at our satellite and radar and the typical activity popping up over the higher elevations in the, with, of Mexico and even West Texas with the terrain circulations. The system that brought us our rain on Tuesday, that's moving through the East Coast right now. Abundant moisture with it. We tapped into some of it, but now there's still a lot of moisture far to the north of us in the Pacific Northwest. That's been coming on shore. It's just being deflected up and around us by the pesky upper level high, the big blue H, and that's going to be in charge of our weather going forward here for several days. So let's get used to the sunshine. 96, that's our current reading, dew point of 62, so it feels like it's one degree warmer than the actual air temperature. And for the most part, we're in the 90s across the state alpine, if you notice at 79, some rain cooled air there. That's the exception and not the norm. Hondo 97, 96 now in, U in New Braunfels, Uvalde at 95. And tomorrow morning, I do think we'll start the day around 73 degrees, 88 at noon, by the afternoon, back into the upper 90s, even flirting with 100 degrees. Along the Rio Grande, I think we'll be above 100. This is often the case. Del Rio 103, Eagle Pass, Carrizo Springs, Catula 101. Gonzales about 97 tomorrow. Get to Timberwood Park, Leon Springs 96. If you're headed to the bay or the beach this weekend, I'm going to start with the bays. It's going to be windy, so there's going to be quite a chop on the back bays. That's something you'll have to contend with, with a wind out of the southeast at about 15 to 25 miles per hour steady. On the beach side, seas of about three feet on Saturday, four to five feet on Sunday and Monday. 
As usual, if you have your tents out there on the beach, you need to anchor them down along with everything else, the umbrellas and everything. Nothing but sunshine. You will notice the wind around here Sunday, Monday and Tuesday gusting up to 30. Adam, thank you. In case you missed it, coming up next. As you finish your work week, let's get you caught up on what happened today. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. There are still a lot of things that need to be answered as DPS officials were here trying to fill in some of the gaps, trying to give some information and facts as to what occurred now that they've looked over surveillance video, uh, now that they've been able to look over just the amount of ammunition that was found within the building itself and basically kind of detail minute by minute exactly what kind of happened and what they think uh, basically could have been done uh, in order to prevent this. In the days following the mass shooting in Uvalde, there are now signs of a bipartisan effort for gun control legislation on Capitol Hill. A group of Democrats and Republicans now working to try and find common ground on gun legislation. It's been close to three decades without any action on gun control, leading the bipartisan efforts, Texas Senator John Cornyn and Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. In the meantime, a San Antonio ISD elementary school and a local business finding a way to reach out and help fellow students at Robb Elementary. This morning, students at Briscoe Elementary School started collecting plush toys for students affected by the tragedy. Their goal? to collect at least one plush toy for every student at Robb Elementary. As the school year comes to a close, one Briscoe fourth grader is hoping that this gesture brings a smile to other students' faces. If you're still looking for ideas on how to help the people affected by this, there are ways right now on KSAT.com. We have a list of ways to help. An account to help the victims has been set up through the First State Bank of Uvalde. HEB as well as Catholic Charities providing assistance to families. If you would like to help just find the story on our website, ksat.com. All right, we're going to take a live look outside right now and tell you where there's a traffic hotspot. That's I-35 at FM 1103. Believe that traffic back up there is that, that those are the northbound lanes and you can see traffic is down to a crawl. So if you're headed that way, just watch out. You know, and I know how Adam loves national days. This is national road trip day. So apparently a there lot of go. people are uh, taking advantage of that, Adam. A day for a road trip, usually that takes a few days, but you depends know, where you're where going. Go. <laughs> then is it a road trip? I don't know. What's the criteria? I don't know. Oh, uh, it's so disputable. I know. So a few clouds. Can we talk about rotisserie chicken again? <laughs> oh, our <laughs> producer Bill would love it. Hey, it's going to be hot this weekend. You're going to feel like rotisserie chicken. See you at 10.